right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, we have attendees. I'm going to go. Uh, my name is Daniela Barbosa. I am the Vice President of Worldwide Alliances here at Hyperledger. So welcome everyone to the Hyperledger in-depth and hour with our members. Um, today we'll be speaking with Alastria, who is uh, one of our new Hyperledger associate members, um, on understanding their mission to promote the digital economy and how the Hyperledger is involved and how you can be involved as well. Um, today's uh, speaker is going to be Jesus Ruiz, who is the member of the board and the CTO of Alastria blockchain ecosystem. And during the Q&A, we're going to also have Brian Bellendorf participate, and he's the general manager of blockchain, healthcare, and identity at the Linux Foundation. Uh, we will open up for a Q&A and promote all the participants um, to panelists so that you can turn on your video as well. Um, but during the chat, um, there's chat and Q&A um, also available. I'd like to start for everybody, maybe a, a good morning, afternoon, and let us know where you're zooming in from. Um, in the chat room, just say, you know, uh, for example, I am in San Francisco, so I would chat. Um, good morning, I'm in San Francisco. So welcome, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. And let's do just some little housekeeping. Um, like all Hyperledger um, events that we have, we do have an antitrust policy. Um, so all our meetings, um, you know, involve participation by industry competitors. So we want to make sure that we conduct all our activities in accordance with the applicable antitrust and competition laws, uh, please do read the full policy um, on our website. Um, if you have any questions, do let us know. Uh, please note that this is being recorded. So this um, re uh, video is being recorded and uh, the webinar recording will be available in our webinar library. Um, and there's a lot of other great content there as well. Um, after the session, we will also provide the slides to be downloaded so that you can have access to that. Once again, if you have any questions, just let us know in the chat. Um, so these Hyperledger in-depth are really uh, ways for our communities to learn uh, what Hyperledger is working on, what our members in our community is working on, but also to share the work that you're doing, um, to ask questions. So as I said, we'll have some Q&A time um, and we look forward to it. Um, if you are new to Zoom, there's a couple of features that you can use. You can use the raise hand um, uh, feature um, and to get promoted to uh, speak. Um, you can also use the Q&A uh, feature in the webinar to ask questions um, or the chat. And I will be monitoring all three of those um, and making sure that your questions get answered. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, hey, who's, do you wanna share your uh, screen and we can get you started? Sure. Yes. All right. And welcome. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, you should be looking at my screen right now, correct? Yes. Okay, so let me minimize everything and then put the cursor here just to help me. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night, uh, or whatever is applicable in your time zone, for giving me the opportunity to explain what we are doing in Alastria. But let me start from the beginning. In 1972, the first public data network in the world was put into operation. At that time, the networks were mostly regional or national before the development of the common protocols that enabled later the interconnection among different networks to become the network of networks, better known as the internet. The definition of public data network implies that any natural or juridical person without any discrimination or arbitrary rules can contract access to the network and use it for any use case that they want. This is not the current definition that was done at, the, at that time, okay? Public data network. But which were the countries pioneering the public data networks in the world? Well, Spain deployed in 1972 the first public data network in the world six years before France, nine before Germany, and even three before the US. Incredibly, that was done in an environment where the Spanish investment level in research and development was five to 10 times lower than the other countries mentioned. Currently, 
And despite many, many problems in Spain, the public administration of Spain is one of the most digitalized in Europe, according to some official rankings. And the penetration of fiber to the home, FTTH, is one of the highest in Europe. This may be the reason why Spain did it again. Spain has been the first to implement a general purpose blockchain network with the so-called public permission model, trying to get the best of two worlds. First, a decentralized governance model, ensuring that anybody can participate. And second, a permissioning system, like in the private consortiums of banks, energy companies with energy companies, or in the networks dedicated to specific use cases like uh, food traceability or any other things. This is a network which is not controlled by any company, group of companies, or even by a single government. A network with the spirit of the internet backbone, which is also decentralized and permissioned at the same time. By the way, the term public permission has to include explicitly the word permissioned because public in the blockchain space is used for public permissionless networks like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. And this is an anomaly that uh, we have to accept when speaking about blockchains. This is what we call the manifesto of public permission blockchain networks. This is the ideal. It's almost impossible to do this right now with the current technology and the current processes, but this is aspirational, the target. First, anyone can participate and use it, and there are no artificial barriers of entry or arbitrary exclusivity. Anyone can participate in the governance of the network if they comply with some conditions which are transparent, fair, and inclusive. There is no anonymity for businesses and other juridical persons. Privacy, yes. Anonymity, no. Like in the real economy and in the real society. At least when we are talking about, and, and uh, uh, probably I had to say that uh, most of the things that I say are based on the values of uh, the European region, the European Union, and uh, any other countries or regions in the world which uh, assume the same values, okay? Then also, protection of the citizen and the consumer is essential and embedded into the system, not something after the fact. It's not an afterthought. And of course, it must be sustainable and help in the future of the circular economy. The model is in reality like a common pool resource, which is not controlled either by the state or by the invisible hand of the market. I, I said again, we don't want this to be controlled by one state or by the invisible hand of the market. And common pool resources have existed for centuries, but they have been normally reduced to the management of natural resources and in a limited geographical scale. For the first time, the blockchain can be considered as a techno-social scarce or limited resource, where the principles of common pool resources can be applied very efficiently by encoding most of the rules into the blockchain infrastructure. That was impossible until, until, until the blockchain. Of course, speculation should be taken as far away as possible from this infrastructure. If we let the traditional market rules or the new game theoretic rules to govern a limited resource, we already know what happens with prices and inclusivity. And if putting together the words permissioned and decentralized seems strange to you, think twice. There is not real decentralization in an anonymous network. Think about the internet backbone, about the real economy, almost anything in the real economy, about any essential public service like public health, public education, or the public roads of a country. They are all permission because if there is a common good, which is not infinite, it's limited, and you need it to be inclusive, fair, neutral and not subject to extreme, extreme speculation and dominated by the rich and powerful, then you need it to be permissioned. But both a good governance model, a decentralized governance model and permissioning. That's the challenge. And that's the challenge that in Alastria, uh, we started three years ago. Alastria is a non-profit association which was uh, created three years ago we are right now more than 500 entities and with a heterogeneous composition. Even though we, it started mainly with big companies as attractors, it is critical to empower small and medium enterprises to participate actively in the evolution of blockchain applications and use cases. And this is one of the missions of the association. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Uh, it is also very important to collaborate with public administrations, research centers, universities, etc. Participation is open to everybody. And for example, existing members cannot arbitrarily exclude other entities from joining, as long as some rules are followed, which has to be, uh, which are transparent, fair, and inclusive. So uh, existing members cannot say, I don't want this competitor to enter the association. Okay. This is like in the real economy, by the way. In addition to being a normal association, normal in the sense that uh, is a, a, a way to exchange, to network uh, between members, one of the main objectives is to promote the creation of actual working and operational public permission networks. And here we see uh, one of the networks, the, the oldest one, okay, which is operated by the members of Alastia. There are others growing based on Hyperledger Bezu and Hyperledger Fabric. Okay? We are agnostic to the technology. It's the members who want to do something with one technology, the ones who are going to uh, take the initiative. And I want to stress the point that the association does not operate any single node or service on the network, the association as legal entity, okay? The association just promotes the network. The network is completely operated by the members and anybody can participate in running the network if they comply with some operational rules that have been set up and accepted by all members of the community. The rules are transparent and non-discriminatory, even though we still have a long way to go in order to make it as decentralized as we want, because the target is really challenging. Uh, by the way, there is no business model in operating the network. This is not a blockchain as a service or similar things, okay? The money for companies is in the applications on top. So the companies want the network to exist because they want to deploy some use cases, and they need a network with these uh, characteristics. There are some, uh, these are some of the use cases that are deployed in, in the Alastia networks. And it is natural that at this moment, if you look at the, at the types of uh, use cases, okay, most of them are of the notarization type. That is, the proof of existence of something in the past. They are much easier to implement <clears throat> than the use cases where interchange of digital value is involved. But this is natural because the focus is on the real economy. Because everything is important, but a special focus is on the red part of the economy. This is trying to represent the whole economy, and this is just focusing on the real economy versus the financial economy. The real economy is the part of the economy that produces goods and services rather than the part that consists of financial services such as banks, stock markets, etc. In reality, the financial economy should be at the service of the real economy because the people are in the middle. And it makes sense because in general, the quality of life of Europeans is very correlated with the gross domestic product, GDP, of the region, which is the real economy, and the efficient and transparent functioning of its public administrations. I have painted in blue, basically the arrows, which are most important in this uh, complex cycle of the real economy, okay? The citizen, the families, the households are at the center of everything, not the contrary. And especially important to the normal citizens are the arrows in blue, which are critical for the well-being of the citizens. Unfortunately, <clears throat> one of the biggest problems we have now is the growing disconnect between the financial economy and the real economy. We all know that. In principle, the financial economy, as I said, should be at the service of the real economy. But lately, especially with digitalization, <clears throat> it seems to be an independent animal which serves only a few, leaving most of the people underserved in the real economy. Most essential needs of human beings are physical, not digital. If you don't eat, you die. The same with water, electricity, and clothing. People need vaccinations, medicines, hospitals, doctors, machinery, instruments, etc. People need roads, vehicles, boats, planes, etc. Can you imagine tokenizing everything and then following on the steps of the Bitcoin and skyrocketing the prices of all essential services? This is one of the major challenges of tokenization. Its focus should be on the real economy and enhances the quality of life of all citizens. <clears throat> it should not be centered on the financial economy in an isolated way. And let me talk a little bit about the real economy. Because a common theme in the blockchain space is we have to decentralize this, we have to decentralize that. But the real economy is already very decentralized and we need the blockchain to coordinate efficiently 
all the activities of many different independent and autonomous entities. There are 30 million businesses in Europe and billions of euros can be saved and productivity improved if coordination is enhanced. And if we speak about public administration services, it is also very much decentralized. Think about local governments in small villages. Decentralization is a good way to be in direct contact with their citizens and provide better services which are relevant to them. The real problem in the real world is how to act efficiently and in a coordinated way. So we have two, uh, two apparently conflicting goals. Better services require decentralization, but efficiency and control require centralization. And blockchain can help. Coordination of decentralized services. That's one of the main challenges. But as I said, the problem is general. Everywhere we look and scratch past the surface, we see coordination complexity that the blockchain can help reduce. The customer, the consumer, the citizen is just here. So we see those chains are not really chains, are webs, are networks, very complex. And <clears throat> let me stress this, contrary to conventional wisdom, the problem in the real economy, the one which is most important for the people is not decentralizing things, but to coordinate efficiently things which are already very, very decentralized. For each pair of entities interacting in the real economy, you see the centralized workflows between them, basically registering compromises, agreements, promises, certifications, etc. And with current technology, many things can go wrong because there is not a single source of truth and reconciliation and inefficiency represents a significant cost, both monetary and for quality of service. And the young customer, the citizen, is the one suffering and paying for that inefficiency. And many times the risk to the health or physical integrity are very, very high. Think about food traceability or vaccination logistics in this pandemic, or thousands of other use cases not related to speculation. For curiosity, you don't see payments in this picture, okay? Because normally the payment is performed several weeks or months after the actual transaction have taken place. Uh, and we can see also that volumes of transactions due to workflows are much higher than the number of payments or actual asset transfers. So you see in the use cases that uh, I displayed before, a typical trend in the real economy, okay? Because in the real economy, the real problem is selling, not getting paid. And continuing with the story, let me talk a little bit about EPSI, okay? Because the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, or EPSI, uh, and Alastria are completely interrelated. EPSI is a joint initiative from the European Commission and member states to deliver European-wide cross-border public services using blockchain technology. The main objective of EPSI is to enhance the provision of cross-border services, including the mobility of citizens and enterprises. And at the same time, it will be a key enabler for the digital transformation of the whole European economic area. The network and initial use cases are approaching production state, which is planned for 2021. And guess what? Two technologies are being used for two types of blockchain networks, Hyperledger Bezu and Hyperledger Fabric, both Hyperledger. So this is good news. And these are the use cases currently being implemented in EPSI. One of them is much more than a use case. The European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework, or ESIF, in short, is a key enabler for all the other use cases, now and in the future. Remember, 500 million people, citizens, and, three, and 30 million companies or businesses, okay? Uh, these are new use cases already accepted, but not yet uh, ready, really, really, really started. Okay. Now, trust, we all know, is a key component of society and the economy. The lower the trust among participants, the higher the cost of transacting among those participants. And the future is not going to be a single network dominating the whole world and for all possible use cases. The future is going, we all know, a network of interoperable networks and centralized systems. And at the top of the figure, Okay, you see a blockchain network that the European Commission and the member states are building, the EPSI, okay, and putting into production this year as a set. The network is called EPSI, okay, because the S is for actual services, not just a void thing, okay. And the main objective is to enhance the provision of cross border services as a set. Even though it's EPSI is a network of governments and public administrations, the new digital identity system developed by the 28 governments and the European Commission uh, will be useful outside of EPSI, especially by the private sector. We all need this. 
And I think that in, in order to cross network boundaries, I have represented here Alastria networks, then FC, but other countries are doing the same thing, but you can have private consortiums and existing systems, even, even though they are not uh, blockchain networks, okay? In order to cross boundaries in a secure and efficient way, many independent networks will use EPSI as an anchoring mechanism to share trusted facts about participants in different networks. And the new pan-European blockchain-based digital identity system is going to play a crucial role in this interoperability. By the way, EPSI is another instance of a public permission blockchain network, like some of the emerging national blockchain networks like EPSI from Italy, and uh, the network from Slovenia and some other um, national blockchain networks. They are all basically following the same public permission blockchain networks. And digital identity, as I said, is the killer application to facilitate interoperability. It is not just digital identity, which is uh, important. It is the, one of the enablers for many, many use cases of uh, interoperability. We need a trusted common digital identity uh, for natural persons, for businesses, and also for things and processes or workflows. Okay. Uh, and given that credentials flow mainly outside of the blockchain, the service provider receiving and verifying them could be in any part of the world, as long as it trusts on the origin network. Okay. If they trust on, let's say, a decentralized blockchain network built by the European Commission and 28 members and all the public administrations that will join the network, okay, with the same public permission principle where nobody can control the network, this is critically important, then as long as the service project trusts the network okay, and has a trusted way to access uh, and verify the credentials, the service project can be anywhere, in Canada, in Latin America, wherever. Okay, and this is how a network could achieve interoperability. And I talk about interoperability because this is one of the main themes that we want right now to pursue in Alastria. Interoperability, not just with EPSI, but also with other blockchain networks, specifically the other national blockchain networks appearing in, in, in Europe and in other parts of the, of the world, but they have to be compatible at the governance level, okay? Uh, and this can be done without connecting the infrastructures or having the bank, for example, a, a bank in Spain onboarding a new customer using credentials from EPSI. For example, imagine a government issuing a credential to one citizen. The citizen can onboard a bank in, other, in, in, in whatever country, okay? Without connecting the infrastructure, without having the bank to participate with a node in the network, uh, where the credential is generated. And by the way, this is essential to any wide ranging tokenization initiative to facilitate exchange of tokens in a compliant way and with minimal friction, okay? And at the end, and I am almost finishing, this is to us the right way to describe interoperability across blockchain networks when the citizen is involved, okay? Again, the most important thing is that the citizen is in the center controlling her data and receiving and sending her credentials from and to different networks. And the networks interoperate thanks to the self-serving identity digital uh, framework, okay? The critical enabler is that the networks trust to each other, at least in the areas where interoperability has to be achieved in benefit of the citizen, who is the most important thing in the world, again. And it is up to the leaders and participants of the different networks and applications to enable this future. A future where identity, decentralization, and interoperability play a crucial role in facilitating the future. I, I will say it again, because they are both together. Identity, identity actually is a human right, okay? Decentralization, the real decentralization, not what many people think decentralization is, and interoperability it play a crucial role in the future. Tokenization is important, but it is just a piece of the whole puzzle that we all have to assemble in a collaborative way. Collaboration is critical. And I really hope that this vision can become a reality soon. And I encourage everybody to not only collaborate with Alastria, which is a very good thing. So you can already come to Alastria, join Alastria, and then collaborate in building the future and also to deploy your applications, because this is an, a, a, a set of networks or an ecosystem where collaboration is, is uh, it's a must, but we are actually building the operational networks, okay, in a collaborative way. 
but uh, also with any other network with the objectives that I explained before, which are expressed in the manifesto and to work together in real interoperability use cases that are useful for the real economy and the real society. The real economy is not going to be dominated by a single network. That's impossible. So we need interoperability. And we are into interoperability. We are just starting a project of interoperability uh, at the European wide uh, uh, area. Okay. So anybody can, can join. And as I said, the real economy is much more than the financial economy, where unfortunately most of the focus is put poorly. And thank you, everybody. And I have finished. Uh, I am open to any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Jesus. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Brian Bellendorf here from uh, the Linux Foundation, from, from uh, Hyperledger as well. Uh, um, we are really looking forward to your questions. Uh, uh, if you can drop them into chat, I think, although, uh, are we going to keep the Q&A tool live um, and want them to drop it in there, or should they just drop it straight into, into chat? Either one is fine. Um, they can also raise their hand and we everybody has talking permitted. So then they can um, speak their question as well. Okay, let's let's do that then. If you have a question that you want me to ask, uh, drop it into chat. Let's not use the Q&A tool and I'll try to keep an eye on that. And if uh, Daniela can help highlight ones that you think are particularly interesting, that'd be cool. Um, if you do want to ask your question live, uh, raise your hand and I'll keep an eye out uh, for that raised hand thing. Uh, uh, and uh, certainly happy to bring you on. Um, I'd love to take the liberty of starting with the first question though. Um, I'd love to know just like some more operational details if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you showed uh, uh, one of the one of the Elastria networks. You have multiple networks, right? Uh, a couple different protocols in use. Um, you mentioned Fabric as one. It sounds like Bezu. You have a Bezu network uh, live as well. You mentioned one that was 120 nodes, 99.99 percent uptime. Which which protocol is that? Well, that's uh, right now it's Quorum, okay, because we started a long time ago. Uh, okay. Then we have Bezu uh, uh, as a smaller network, but growing. Uh, but our strategy, I would say, is to, to mix both uh, in the Ethereum uh, side of technologies, is to mix uh, Quorum, Bezu, and other uh, clients, because we think diversity is a must for a, for, a, for a network which cannot be put behind variables or whatever. This is uh, like, uh, like Ethereum, let's say, but uh, permission. So you can think of, uh, of this network like Ethereum. So it's open to attacks from everybody. So we need uh diversity we we need uh, byzantine fault tolerance and so on okay yeah. and then we have hyperledger and i see that uh, in the audience there is jorge ordovas okay who can talk about this uh, fabric network okay better than me because uh, he's uh, leading the the one of the of the persons leading this this network this is just a new network okay cannot claim that is so big but is with uh, fabric uh, which has a lot of potential okay Okay. And um, is the general approach that those nodes are run um, like in a small number of data centers you know, for performance and, and the like, or that it's it's highly spread out, that each company makes their own decision about where the node that represents them uh, lives? That, that's a good question. Okay. And then I will ask as Alastria, because I am also participating in, in, in EPSI, because I am, I am part of the team uh, deploying mm -hmm. the, the pan-European blockchain network. Okay. So in Alastria, the rule is that you can deploy wherever you want as long as your node is inside the European Union because legal reasons or whatever. So you can deploy wherever. But you know that when you uh, can do this, at the end, there is a very limited set of, the, uh, of uh, data centers in Europe, and you see some concentration of nodes in uh, some nodes, for example, in Germany, in France, in Ireland, and, and, and so on. Okay? Now, if I answer uh, from the European Union perspective, okay, we are setting up rules where uh, we try to avoid concentration on data centers, okay, because otherwise they could choose all uh, uh, AWS, for example, or Azure. We don't want that. We want this to be as spread as possible, so there is not a single entity dominating any single aspect of the whole thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's great. That's great. And Alaska, you can, you can, you are free to to put the nodes, and you can see that they 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 are deployed in in Amazon, in Azure, in whatever you want. Okay, basically, even on-prem. Great. 
um, <clears throat> sometimes there's a challenge in supporting that mode, though, which is, I mean, even if they're all in the same continent, uh, latency can be a real killer for, you know, the Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms. Is there, have there been upper limits that you've hit uh, with just the existing sets of nodes in terms of performance and, and suitability to purpose? That's a good question. We haven't found uh, any major problems related to this. I, I know that in many, in many uh, papers and so on, uh, they talk about the latencies and so on. Uh, in our experience, the connectivity between data center to data center, because you have to, to take into account that this is not consumer grade uh, things. These are typically deployed on data centers. Uh, we have found that uh, from data center to data center is not the same as when you are deployed in, inside a data center, but latency is not a problem. And we have seen that, for example, all the nodes running the consensus, okay, where we have uh, uh, more than, than 10 right now, and, and we, have, we have an algorithm uh, set in place, uh, that's not a problem. Latency okay. is not a problem as far as we have uh, seen, but uh, under an attack, maybe that will be a problem, okay, because then they can, they can disrupt the network. Well, that's that's a good question. Have you um, had any examples of bad actors uh, or an attack on the network yet? Have you had to, to be resilient against somebody standing up a node and being, you know, there under false pretenses or, or spamming the network or anything like that? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, well, actually, actually, we started trying to expand the network. Uh, we have had several companies trying to do not just the typical uh, uh, ethical hacking and so on, but trying to 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 take the network down. And then the network, of course, is not the same. But uh, uh, okay, uh, I have been 15 years, sorry, uh, in Banco Santander. Okay, uh, technology and so on, and well, uh, 30 years in banking. Okay, before joining, in, in, first in IBM and so on, just for retail banking. I can tell you that I have never ever seen such a robust technology for such a low, let's say, price. You need to do things in a different way, but. Uh, I have never seen uh, any other way to deploy an infrastructure which is so resilient and so robust mm -hmm. as this. Now, having said that, the speed is just very bad, okay? As a database, it's horrible, okay? As a write-only database. For read-only or for read and queries, it's incredibly uh, resilient, okay? So from the point of view, Resiliency, I have never seen. I mean, it's impossible that a single company can deploy something like this. Impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you do the right things, this is much, uh, is, is better, is, uh, has a much higher resiliency than what, for example, Amazon can do or Google alone. I can, I can say that. Okay. I, I know this is pretentious. Okay. But uh, no. Well, that's great. The technology um... is incredibly good. Yeah, uh, and when you're thinking about the, uh, 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 the, the amount of volume you anticipate, um, clearly a related question uh, is what kind of use cases this is suitable for? Because if it's a financial services use case, then you're gonna start, if it's, if it's like immediate settlement on all retail payments in Europe, that would be you know, tens of thousands of transactions a second you'd have to support, right? Um, are you finding that the, with, the, with this architecture, you're trying to choose use cases that are much lower volume? Uh, and uh, does that tend you away from financial services and towards supply chain or, or, or government permitting or some other types of processes or use cases? Okay, let me just uh, start saying that, okay, I, I understand why, but we are focusing on one of the networks, okay, but uh, fabric is another thing, and then probably uh, some of the technology will come because uh, uh, in the same vein that uh, we think that uh, the world is not going to be dominated by one single network, the world is not going to be dominated by a single technology, and there may be different technologies for different problems, so you may have one problem, one solution like in the real world, okay? Now, having said that, uh, my opinion, because Alastria, okay? Uh, I am board member for, of, of Alastria, but uh, you can have a, a lot of opinions. Actually, we, we are 500 uh, uh, entities or more than 500. And as we say in Spain, if you have 500 Spanish people, you have 500 different opinions, okay? So this is just my opinion. So my opinion is that the network that we're talking about, Red T, okay? is suitable not for every use case that you can drop. I, I see this like, like also an anchoring mechanism. And I have already talked to some uh, uh, entities, okay, businesses in, 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 the, in, in the Alastria Association, because uh, the network is permission only for joining the network, for putting a node. 
Once you have joined, you can deploy. It's like in Ethereum. Then you can deploy whatever use case. So deploying this, uh, use cases and smart contracts on applications is not permissioned. Okay, mm -hmm. it's only putting your node. So this is very, you, very very important. Okay? Do you implement a? Do you have gas fees then uh, as a way to try to constrain or? We we are we are in the process right now. Is for free because the network is uh, we have uh, only three million transactions uh, per month. Okay, so this is not enough to to, to bring the, the network on. So we want to 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 keep this as free and cheap as possible, and then we are preparing for the future where if uh, congestion comes, then you will have to pay for the network. Okay. Okay. But, but at, if... at, at network prices. Okay. So so it's like uh, telcos. Okay. Now having said that, I see Alastria this network more as an anchoring mechanism. So you can, for example, build private consortium and then you can uh, you can basically notarize every night or every hour on this network, okay? Instead of in Ethereum here, because then you have all the all the legal things, okay? Because that's to me the only way to achieve real scalability. Okay. Okay. So if like an NFT use case popped up, a public NFT use case popped up on Alastria and suddenly started driving, you know, tens of millions of transactions a day, um, uh, your recommendation would be use the Alastria blockchain as an anchor, but set up a private set of uh, nodes between a couple of other parties. I mean, that does affect decentralization a little bit, right? Um, and it, the nice thing about exchanging NFTs on the Ethereum blockchain is you can do it atomically with payment, right? Uh, uh, which you, it's harder to do in kind of a, a subtree kind of arrangement, but um, uh, but that certainly is you know kind of it's almost like manual sharding in a way you know kind of like manually kind of dividing out by by busyness or use case. Uh, I guess it just is a function of how easy is it to set up these uh, these subtrees, these side channels, these uh, however, however you know one wants to call them. So you have to take in, into account something, okay? Because uh, in Alastria, all the uh, nodes are typically deployed not by individual natural persons are businesses so they have identities so mm -hmm. the 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 blockchain networks in reality i mean uh, some new business models uh, can be appearing okay mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for making more efficient existing processes okay then uh, you don't really need to do what you have to do when uh, you have to operate with a chinese uh, guy okay from the us because mm -hmm. you are inside the European Union or inside a trade corridor where you already have solved this. So you have identities, you have digital signatures, you have uh, uh, the ability to go to the, uh, jurid uh, to, the, to the jurisdiction or to, to whatever, okay, to, to, the, to the legal system. So the legal system, we have to avoid this as much as possible, but it's just there, just in case you need it. Because then you have all the traceability or the immutability because uh, contrary to what people think in a permission network, if you do the right things, you have immutability, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you have digital signatures, come on, okay? So you need do you, to- do you have the, Do you have the ability on, a, on, the, on the Alastria network if, if one node is being a bad actor and is pumping out lots of you know, transactions, kind of swamping the capacity or I, I, you know, otherwise trying to do things that the rest of the community <clears throat> doesn't feel is right, is there a governance mechanism by which the other Alastria nodes can vote uh, and have that one removed? Well, uh, we have the governance model in place because uh, when you join the network, you have to uh, comply with uh, some operational rules which are published in the web, okay? And the operational rules establish some things uh, which uh, you have to comply with, okay? Specifically this thing, okay? So that's a human governance, that's a human governance function. It's like if, if a bad actor popped up as humans, you talk about it and try to come up to some negotiated thing. And what ultimately is your lever to pull the plug on that bad actor? Well, we can do this, okay, but we have not automated this, okay? But, but basically we have the rules because the rules, I, I mean, it, the rules are there. So the tools can be implemented. Uh, remember, we are a, a non-profit association. Our muscle is very, very limited because it's non-profit. So actually uh, the association is living from the, from the members. Everything in Alastria, almost everything is done by the members. Mm -hmm. So the members can say, we don't want this guy and we have committees of, of members uh, the validator nodes for example okay there is a committee of validator nodes that decide several things okay for example upgrading and so on but in a transparent way because uh, we don't want any any black uh, box okay so everything 
is totally transparent. Of course, sure. we are far from, uh, let's say, the, 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 the vision that uh, we have, okay? Why? Because it's difficult, come on. I, I mean, this is, but what we have implemented is a decentralized mo uh, model, okay? Where many, many things are still manual and we are doing steps into these objectives, okay? Mm -hmm. But the rules are already set up. Yeah, and, and this is something that the, in the open source community we think about all the time is, you know, even though it feels like the, at the root of open source software is the license and is obviously the, the software itself, um, uh, these communities work because, because the, uh, the, the license gives you the right to fork and that ultimately holds those in power to, to check. If Linus Torvalds ended up making a series of bad decisions, right? Um, the rest of the Linux community can take his kernel project in a different direction. They might have to change the name, right? But um, that, that right to fork uh, is like core to the concept of open source software. Um, and it's interesting that it's a part of the, the public blockchain space where, you know, uh, when there is that debate in the Ethereum ecosystem about reversing the, um, the, the, the DAO hack, right? You know, uh, that spawned the Ethereum classic kind of thing, that right to fork, I mean, it's a pretty impressive thing to watch. Do you think on uh, either Elastria or in general on, on kind of pr public permission to blockchains, we'll see uh, uh, this kind of right to fork. Is that important? Is that part of your governance model already? Like what happens if there is a really bad dispute inside of, you know, your board, inside of the, the validator network? Could two networks come out of that? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, 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 this can happen. Uh, actually, actually, even more than that. I mean, the, the existing network, okay, the Red Team, uh, because I am representing a company which is in the validator nodes. So uh, it doesn't belong, the network does not belong to Alastria. Alastria promotes that the members uh, generate the network. But if we, uh, this, is, this is not going to happen because it's a win-win relationship, okay? It's, it's a symbiosis. But if the network wants to go away from Alastria, they can do that. Of course, then we could not be using the Alastria name or whatever. So the right to fork is always there, should be there, because otherwise, I mean, you have to have the freedom to do whatever you want. Yeah. Now, having said that, when you are talking about FC and the and the European blockchain service infrastructure, the right to fork is a little more okay. So in the it's controversial. Sector, it's it's you know, yeah, um, yeah. and there's certainly other blockchain governance networks I can think of where that's not allowed because the premise is like, no, the data that's written maybe it's sensitive data, or you know, I, I you know, it's just people are more used to a top-down structure in their governance. They're not students of Eleanor Ostrom, like 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 you are and others. And so I, uh, that's why I'm really, really passionate about seeing Elastria succeed. And, and hopefully EBSI can also incorporate many of these, uh, many of this thinking, but we won't know if it works until it's been, you know, really put to the test, right? Um, I, and Okay, I, I was going to say this. This is something that we have started, okay? Uh, we uh, thought we need a type of network which looks like this. Let's try it. We don't know if we are going to succeed, okay? But yeah. it's three years and counting, okay? And we are growing and, and, and the model is spreading. So it looks like, okay, we had something, but we had more questions than answers and we still have, okay? Because nobody knows what the future is, is going, but we know what is the objective. And the objective is to try to build something like the internet. Is mm -hmm. the blockchain has to be something which is available, cheap for a fair price, which is permission like the internet, because in order to access the internet, you are permission, where you have to have privacy, of course, okay? And where everybody can participate to, to do the electronic businesses, okay? With a much more resilient infrastructure, but the network should be there. You mm -hmm. shouldn't be creating different networks like with the internet. So you shouldn't be asking to other company, okay, let's try to build these use cases, um, like a consortium, Let's try to build our own infrastructure because otherwise it's not possible. No, no, no. The network should be there. And then you can deploy many different use cases like in the, in the internet, okay? Yeah. So the internet is something that is out of discussion right now. You assume the internet to exist and everybody to have access. That's I want to remind uh, folks listening, you know, uh, we really welcome questions. Uh, and uh, if you want to ask a question live, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, and I'm watching kind of the participant list to look for raised hands. I haven't seen any yet. So uh, that's cool. Also, feel free in chat to send a message uh, 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 if you have a question to ask. So far, there was one submitted from Marta Piekarska uh, asking, uh, how will these mixes work? How can a network handle many types of nodes? And let me actually 
actually extrapolate upon that to ask kind of a two-part question. One is, you know, when you have lots of different protocols you support, right? Uh, Bezu and, and Quorum are pretty close. And I think there's, there's even the chance that they'll get even closer to being truly compatible clients on the same networks. Um, you've got Fabric, which is a very different approach. Uh, it's it's a, a, a very different philosophy than the Ethereum ecosystem about uh, how to build those kinds of apps. Um, and if you want to be truly agnostic, you have the door open to potentially others. Since you talked about self-sovereign identity so much, I'm guessing maybe there's some openness to like Hyperledger Indie being a part of the network too. But it's really hard to be good at all things, right? And uh, do you think uh, a network like uh, Elastria can actually be protocol agnostic uh, you know, or technology agnostic, or will it have to like make a hard choice about uh, a small number of technologies? Uh, I think that at the end, again, the decision is not taken by Alastria Association, it's by the members. And you see a concentration, like uh, for example, with databases, okay? So uh, you had uh, many relational databases uh, 40 years ago and so on coming, and then at the end you had only um, three. Okay, basically. Then the NoSQL databases appear. Then you have thillions. And then at the end, on the real use cases, you have a limited choice. So this is natural. This is going to happen. So which ones are going to be the survivors? Okay, the market will decide. Okay, basically the members. But can get, uh, for, can example, right now, for example, we don't have Corda. Well, is this a choice of a constant choice of Alastria? No, I mean, we are agnostic, but the members of Alastria have not requested Corda. Okay, yeah. that's... That makes and a lot then, of sense. Yeah, and then, and then let me, let me also uh, say something about the mixing protocols, okay? Because one thing, as you really mentioned, is to mix different client implementations of the same protocol, like for example, IBFT2 or whatever, uh, which is happening in the uh, Ethereum-based or Enterprise Ethereum uh, Alliance, okay? Because then you have Bezu, Quorum, they are going, uh, you have from uh, other uh, Clearmatics and so on. They are joining forces to define a common protocol and then different implementations. Now, Fabric is, as you said, is a different animal, okay? But my opinion, it would be fantastic to have uh, different implementations of the same, uh, let's say, client, okay? Peer nodes with different languages for example instead of uh, go to have one go and one in 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 rust for example okay but why this is complex but this is adding diversity yeah. now if this is not possible then you have to add diversity by uh, not using the same data center so you mix uh, amazon azure and so on uh, different companies okay because the critical thing is that if a bad actor enters into one node controlled by one entity. The idea is that this effort cannot be replicated to, to the other nodes. So they have to do another effort and another effort and every, every company has to have different policies, okay? So diversity is critical. Now, if you can apply diversity to all the levels of the protocol stack, that's fantastic. If you cannot, you have to do whatever you can. Okay. Yeah, no, I, 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 it, it does it does surprise me. I would have expected to see a um, an implementation of the Fabric protocol in Rust, uh, I, you know, or or uh, Python or something like that, and other languages uh, as a uh, emerge eventually over time. Maybe we will. Um, I, I, maybe that's a way we actually look at you know evolution within the Fabric community. But um, it's interesting interesting point. Um, <clears throat> you know, I do want to get back to kind of your comparison to like the early days of the internet because. Um, you know, it is possible to support different protocols, have these different networks, uh, but in the early days of the net, it would not have worked if we had different DNSs or different uh, systems for allocating IP addresses. And I kind of think, you know, those early institutions on the internet, uh, first IANA, uh, which allocated addresses and uh, uh, and then um, the network solutions contract, which eventually became ICANN for the domain name system. <laughs> Those all kind of emerged long before we realized how important all of this was, right? <laughs> I think it'd be hard to reinvent some of those today. If we had to come up with an institution to fairly allocate new IP addresses, uh, it would be intensely political and be very hard to get uh, yep. consensus on. So um, <clears throat> I think the good news is because we have uh, ICANN and uh, uh, ways of doing uh, um, you know, IP addresses, we can actually support lots of different options at the levels above. But there's still the law of network effects. There's still, you know, all the power that Google and Twitter have is because every 
every, that's where everybody is, right? And so I think there'll be this tension. There'll be forces that encourage proliferation and forces that encourage consolidation. Uh, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where that ends up when it comes to uh, blockchain network uh, architecture. So um, it'd be really cool to yeah, see. No, I'm, 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 that, that's a very good point that uh, you made. Uh, but let me let me also speak about another uh, blockchain network that uh, appeared in one of my slides is Lackchain, which is uh, uh, a Latin American and Caribbean uh, blockchain network promoted by the uh, IDB. Okay, the 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 development bank there. Okay, which is not a bank. Uh, the, it's an institution with the purpose of uh, developed countries, okay, and the regional. Uh, so uh, it's very interesting that, okay, I, I am also participating there, okay, together with some other people from Alastia, because Alastia is a founding member of those, uh, of this network, okay. Uh, in this network, it's, it's operational right now, but it's growing, okay, it started after Alastia, but they are setting up, let's say, the governance center, okay, in the same building where uh, LACNIC, okay, so the uh, internet institutions are living, okay, because I, I think it's impossible to replicate uh, what, uh, as, as you mentioned, okay, the internet, but we have a lot of, of things to learn from the governance model of different heterogeneous things, okay, and, and they are in the same building and basically they are with the same philosophy, okay, so we need something like the internet, with, it's, it's, it's a different animal, okay, it's a, completely different animal, but the principle should be the same. That's the key thing, okay? And uh, as you mentioned, it's impossible to replicate these institutions, but this is this is a problem, okay? It would be fantastic. But, uh, but uh, again, the internet uh, needed a lot of years, many, many years, okay? So we are still in the infancy of this type of network. So, so we cannot just run and then do everything uh, at the same time, okay? Yeah, well, we certainly um, all want to do things on a shorter amount of time frame too than the 40 years the internet's had and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes from the internet architecture like the cookie header um, that led to <laughs> so much damage. Um, let me uh, ask kind of what I think is an implicit second half of Marta's question, um, which is around interoperability and integration. Um, are there are there tools? Uh, uh, well, let me ask this: Are you tracking any of the efforts like Cosmos or uh, the the uh, IBC, the uh, or or even things like in Hyperledger, like Cactus, as <clears throat> potential toolkits to make it easier to do cross-chain <laughs> kinds of transactions? Is there anything that the the membership that the last gen membership has gravitated towards as a way to to do this? Yeah. Well, there, there is an interoperability work group because in Alastria you, you, you do things uh, in, in work groups, okay, where the members uh, collaborate uh, voluntarily, yeah. and there is an interoperability one, okay. And then in this interoperability uh, work group, there are uh, some um, themes, okay. Uh, one of the main themes is uh, cactus, okay, based on cactus. So, so we have uh, explained cactus, and then there's activity around cactus. Now, having said that, Interoperability uh, is, is very complex. And I have, uh, well, tomorrow, tomorrow I, I go to the European Commission for, for explaining the approach. You have different layers, okay? Cactus is basically on the lower technical layers. But the interoperability initiatives that we are starting uh, with some other networks uh, uh, in Europe is starting from the top, okay? So without interconnecting the networks for use cases that are not exchange of value, which are just proof of something in the past. So they are just notarizations. Interoperability is much easier to do. Think about a diploma, okay? A diploma. A diploma can be registered in one blockchain, basically a hash. Well, it's more complex than a hash in, in, in the use case, but at the end you write once and then you, you query many times in many places. So you don't have to uh, exchange value. There is no trading, there is no exchange of value. So, so it's a proof of uh, thing, okay? Actually in the real economy, many things are like that. So the interoperability, uh, actions are starting in many layers, but where you will see actual use cases being put into production is going to be first in, uh, let's say, notarization or workflow use cases because they are much simpler and mm -hmm. we don't use uh, anything like Cactus. Okay, so I, I don't know if I, I explained this uh, thing, but, yeah. but uh, different types of use cases have different problems and then Using, for example, uh, self-sovereign identity, you can make interoperable many, many applications wherever uh, they are, okay? Yeah. For example. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> no, a lot of important things. I think that 
uh, uh, like the most frequent use case for this kind of cross-chain integration that I can think of is, um, you know, paying for for goods and shipment, right? You know, where you've got one ledger that's tracking supply chain, another ledger that's tracking uh, that that is designed for payments, right? You know, it might even be Ethereum or Bitcoin or something like that, and just wanting to make sure those transactions are atomic, so that you know I'm paying and I now have title to that, you know, on the on the second ledger. Um, so lots of stuff being worked on in this space. It is actually interoperability month at Hyperledger, so. So on our on Twitter and our social feeds, we're trying to highlight examples of where this is happening. And, and Cactus is actually uh, one of two projects right now inside of Hyperledger. There's another one called Weaver that's in labs. And we're seeing some interest in potentially more code coming in uh, that might bring us closer into the Cosmos kind of ecosystem around IBC. So I think there's there's a lot of activity there. Um, uh, we're, we're just getting down. There was a question in Q&A about how do we address the risk of Turing completeness of ETH-based smart contracts? which I think is a related question to the gas fees question and bad actors question, because um, I, you know, I know ETH contracts are designed to try to not be infinite loop and, and, and keep going, but I think the question about Turing completeness is um, uh, that there's the possibility of, you know, it's, it's the, uh, what, what's the halting problem, right? You know, that might keep contracts running forever, consuming resources. So um, again, it's kind of back to the question of, are there bad actors? Have there been bad actors? How have you addressed them? Uh, do you need to introduce gas fees? I think we talked a bunch about that, but anything else you wanted to add on that? Well, uh, actually, we haven't seen any bad actors, okay, even though but there may have been, okay, because, because as I said, uh, we have tried to, to bring down the network, okay, and uh, the fact, well, that was one of the first modifications we made to Quorum, okay, because the initial implementation of Quorum, and, and back uh, when I was still in, in Santander, uh, didn't have implemented gas, okay, so they eliminated completely gas. And one of the things that we made a fix in Santander and then we asked uh, for the implementation, for the real implementation is, please re-enable gas, but the cost is not uh, is zero, okay? So basically when you execute a transaction in Alastria, you need to supply an amount of gas. So mm -hmm. at the end, if you enter into a loop, essentially, uh, eventually you run out of gas, even though you bought gas with uh, zero euros. Okay. So at the end, uh, it's like uh, running in Ethereum, but the cost of the gas, okay, or is right now zero, but yeah. we are going to uh, put a price uh, as soon as the network starts uh, being. That's okay, that's really helpful. Um, I, just really quick in like 10, 15 seconds, how might anybody who's watching uh, this uh, get involved with Elastria? Well, <clears throat> Uh, there are two ways, mainly, okay? One is if you want a network or networks, okay? Depending on your use case. If you have something, some use case on fabric, okay? We are already, we have already a network ready for production where you can enter, okay? Uh, it has a freemium model, let's say, okay? So you can experiment for free and then you can, you can if you want the production level things and then you, can, you want SLA and so on, then of course you will have to pay. But paying for a shared infrastructure is much less than paying for a purpose-built infrastructure, okay? So this is available for any, anybody. Anybody can join Alastria, so you have to join Alastria. In order to join Alastria, if you are a, an NGO, uh, you pay nothing. Uh, if you are a, a startup, you pay 500 euros per year. Uh, if you are a medium enterprise, small and medium enterprise, say 5,000 euros per year, or if you are a big, uh, 10,000. So this is, uh, and then you can use the networks. So Great. depending on your use case, Fabric, Ethereum, uh, you can join Alastria and deploy your networks there. And by the way, uh, join other members with interesting use cases in an actual uh, set of uh, production ready networks. Okay. Fantastic. Thank the you. The second thing is if you have another network uh, with the same, let's say, compatible objectives, let's talk and let's talk about interoperability, but real interoperability. Let's get use cases, real use cases, and then let's see if mm, there are enough members in Alastria and enough, let's say, uh, resources in, in your network. And let's try to make a real interoperability use case because <laughs> we have to, to do things practicing. Okay.
Okay, so thank, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, this has been a really fun uh, hour. I mean, let me pass the microphone back to Daniela just to close us out. Uh, yeah, so a couple more things. So thank you, Jesus and Al Alastria. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, we will be taking a month from these Hyperledger in-depth webinars and we'll be returning again in July with uh, DLT Global, Bonafé and Mindtree. But there's plenty of content for everyone. Uh, we are hosting our annual global forum, which is a virtual event this year, June 8th through the 10th. We'll have two global segments uh, for Asia Pacific, Europe, and the Americas. Um, and we have three days of content with over 100 different talks, including another one from Alastria going a little bit deeper into the topic that we discussed again. So please do join us there. Uh, we have a lot of pro project, Hyperledger project, technical talks and developer talks and lots of different topics. Um, and feel free to use the 20% discount code. Uh, the registration fee is only 50 US dollars, but um, please go ahead and use the 20% uh, discount code that you see there on the screen. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, everyone, for attending and see all of you at Hyperlogic Global Forum. Okay. Thank you, everybody.